Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations and student leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're discussing the important topic of youth and teen mental health care, resources, and needs with special guests. Mariko Seak, Executive Director of CASI, Counseling and Support Services for Youth, and David Mineta, a President and CEO of Momentum for Health in California. It's just great to, to, to have you here. We're going we're gonna to set this up. We're going to go over to you, uh, Mariko, uh, first. And I, I'll just set this up by saying that the COVID situation has really caused us to appreciate uh, the mental health impact of, of uh, daily events that we have. And it really has hit our youth uh, really hard. Uh, we're also beginning to understand that there is a intrinsic connection between uh, mental health behavioral health and and physical health, um, how that affects us. And we're even doing research in which we have proved that uh, trauma, stress, and so on can actually affect our DNA's development. And messages can be transmitted that affect behavior across generations. So treatments start to have to uh, consider what has happened to our parents and our grandparents as well. So Let's talk a little bit about this vulnerable time, sort of teenage ad- adolescence. And Rico, could you just give us a, a quick overview of the kind of services that you provide? Then we're going to get into some of the issues that I just mentioned. Uh, but but talk a little bit about Cassie and, and how you uh, came to be and the scope of your activities today. Okay. Well, thank you for having me today. Um, and I, I look forward to spending the morning with both you and David. So I think I'm going to just touch on and reemphasize what you just said, Mark. Unmet mental health needs have a strong impact on a student's academic performance and their social and emotional development. And Cassie started in 2009 to really address that problem. We have shown um, since our beginning that students are far, far more likely to seek counseling when counseling is on their campus, when they see their therapist on a regular basis, and you weave mental health support into a daily curriculum, similar to what many schools have already done with PE, physical education. Uh, We are in preschools through high schools in San Mateo and Santa Clara County. Our therapists are located right on campus, and so they are just like staff and, and support and understand the community and the culture within each of our schools. Each so it's also separately funded, right? It's separately funded, separately staffed. Correct. What you're doing is you're creating within a school a treatment capability. Absolutely. Right? And- Absolutely. And so we can, um, and depending on what the school wants, we can do, and depending on the age, it's very age appropriate, we can do group counseling, school presentations, or individual one-on-one counseling, depending on the needs. And then what we also do that's vital is that we provide a triage. So we we determine, is this appropriate for school-based counseling? There's cases that are not. And then we then work with them to seek outside resources, such as Momentum, such as other agencies, so that they have the appropriate care outside of that school environment. So we're that warm handoff. So for, for, for this approach to be successful, uh, David, you, you really need to get to the point where um, these types of interactions are destigmatized, right? I mean, we really have to get to the point where, as Cassie has, has described it, the, the approach to mental health is kind of integrated into our daily lives, in this particular case, schools, right? Absolutely. It's hard to think of something more um, important right now than our young folks um, mental wellness um, and you know actually in this discussion I would also include mental health as well as substance use disorder as well uh, age of onset for both uh, is around the same same time uh, same you know uh, developmentally around the same time that is a time of such um, sort of development where, your peers and your social network really matter so much to you. And highly stigmatized issues are tough to get at and to, and, you know, to speak on and to, to really go out and get help for. Um, so, you know, as, as Mariko said, I think it's so key uh, to have services on campus. You know, our, I would just say that I feel like our, our own, my own kids, when they needed uh, um, services, again, when it was on campus, 
the school supported it. There was a climate for it. Um, uh, was you know made such a difference? Let's let's start to unpack sort of the dimensions of of stress that can lead to mental health issues. As you're going into your teens, you're making the transition from being a cared for child with the consciousness of a child to toward the consciousness of the uh, of an adult you're starting to think about your responsibilities more towards others and to your family, right? So you're now shifting your role. You think about your own identity, right? There's so much here. And then you you pile on um, issues of budding awareness of COVID and masks and how to keep yourself safe and your grandparents safe. And and there's so many different, different issues. How do you untangle this complexity that young people are encountering, Mariko? How do you meet people where they are? Because you just don't know, right? Each person has these, these different intersecting issues. And, and no, you, you can't just deal with young people as if they were a clustered group, right? Where you're standing in front of people and you say, okay, we all have the same problem here. We don't all have the same problem. We all have completely individual constellations of, uh, of, of concern. I mean, absolutely. What you've just said there is what, um, a, what a typical teen is going through. Um, and that those concerns are, are, are going younger and younger. And so it's not just actually teens. We're seeing more and more of this anxiety in elementary schools, but we, we do it in, in several approaches. So, uh, what, and we do it in what we call three tiers. The first tier is just that preventative. We do a lot of presentations so that at a snapshot, students understand that what they're feeling is what every other person is feeling right now. And then providing an avenue for them to seek resources. And so you're not alone. That's your first message. You're not alone. Absolutely. And then we go into what we call our tier two, where those that want to talk more, but aren't necessarily ready to go into that individual counseling. Those are our tier two group counseling. Um, And then tier three, where we do that intense weekly counseling that is that is what um based on based on a specific issue and what you typically find either in private practice or if you were to go to a clinic but meeting them where they're at and where they're comfortable is the key to our success because a child as we all know you can ask how are you doing and you'll get the typical fine but unless you have the patience to wait until they're ready to say something beyond find um, I think that's where we need to be patient. And I think that's where we need to be willing to sit in silence so, so that they know they're not alone. No? So you're making two really important points. The first thing is listening first, right? Letting yes. letting a young person tell you what they need. But the second issue is, is also um, uh, the response, right? How do you respond? I have a question for you, David. Um, we just completed a poll, really interesting. We asked, uh, what role does social media play in mental health for teens? You know, a lot of our communication goes over these, these uh, mobile devices nowadays. And, um, you know, it's, it's, they're, they're ubiquitous, right? Social media is all over the place. And we found that a third of the people said that, that social media is mostly negative. It's a communication uh, vehicle, but it's very manipulated. Co- um, uh, social media is very manipulated um, uh, interactions. Two thirds said it can have positive and negative effects, but nobody said it's mostly positive. How do you see these kinds of devices where a lot of communication is happening affecting um, teen mental health or or does it? Yeah, you know, um, and I would just point out, uh, you know, Mark, in the last six months, um, you know, uh, leading um, pediatric experts have signaled this mental health crisis among youth and teens uh, across the country. And then the Surgeon General, uh, my former colleague, uh, Dr. Murthy, uh, put out a report in December, um, an advisory, calling out um, this um, crisis around youth and teen mental health. And what he did is he signaled in there around social media. Put a, he, he put a circle around social media, around the, um, 
more around the the concerns and um, you know added um, sort of negative influence that social media can have on our nation's youth uh, and teens. As, as being a driver of in a negative way. Yeah, of, absolutely. Of mental health and and. Uh, Dr. Murthy, I think, has also uh, there was just a study that basically uh, talked about the interrelationship between physical and mental health as well. Right. And, Absolutely. And- I mean, I think, you know, I would encourage everyone uh, to read the advisory if you haven't already. I think it's, um, you know, beautifully written. Um, the data points are s- compelling um, and they rolled up a lot of best practice Um and, you know, really good advice also for the families, for the parents uh, in reading through it, uh, being a parent of teens. Oh, my gosh. Um, you know, it, it's just it's it's very enlightening. And it's, um, you know, I, I'd say, uh, you know, pure B- Vivek. I mean, I think he's just he's right on on this right now. And so important to get this out. You know, one thing I would say, just to go back to your point around stress the numbers that we saw before COVID, teen um, youth and teen uh, mental wellness um, numbers were very concerning, right? Very concerning before COVID. And since COVID, a lot of those numbers have actually um, worsened, right? And again, um, you know, the, the conclusion by experts, researchers, again, is that that stress the trauma of, of the pandemic, um, you know, family members being sick, caregivers being sick and dying, um, you know, so many related things, um, isolation, uh, being home from school, not being around teachers and caring adults, um, you know, out of the house uh, has, has, has had this, um, you know, uh, increase of stress, increase of, of uh, mental health disorders substance use disorders. Uh, and, you know, again, this conversation is so important. How do we turn a lot of those around? So let's talk about turning those, those around because we've already um, exhausted the, the, the topic of understanding, of listening, of meeting young people where they actually are and integrating this uh, into our daily lives. Let's talk about the the uh, the treatment uh, approach. We're not talking about the traditional model of sitting somebody down in some couch in what they are experiencing. Could you talk a little bit about the attitude that your staffs have toward the expertise of the youth as their own guide for for uh, their own mental health treatment? Mariko? Definitely. Um, A couple of things to unpack there. One is, yes, children are far more like when they are the ones dropping in seeking counseling, they're driving their in many ways their treatment. But we are mindful that they are still a child and that the most effective way to address their challenges is to involve the family. Absolutely, there are times where parents um, may not may actually be contributing to that, and we will we'll seek what we call our minor consent. But a lot of these dynamics are family dynamics, and so I want to be mindful that for for any parents that are listening, they're not being excluded from the equation. But yes, children are far more likely to drive their success if they are the ones coming in seeking treatment. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it across the board. The stigma is decreasing with minors um, the younger we get because we have this open conversation about mental health. I think our biggest issue is now that we have them to the intake, having the time to provide that treatment and then having that time to send them to an appropriate outside provider, again, if we realize that it's not a school-based model. Um, As I share with other colleagues, there are just certain issues that cannot be unpacked in a school. It's not appropriate. And then, you know, you can't have someone open up and then send them to math class. And that's why these conversations with David and and partnerships with agencies that can work with families and provide that treatment in a safe environment outside of a campus is vital. David, could you describe some of the treatment services that you provide? 
Yes, uh, I'd be happy to, Mark. Um, you know, we uh, are a community-based nonprofit. We, you know, like Mariko, um, we have uh, both on-campus and uh, uh, site-based, agency site-based um, uh, outpatient services. Uh, we also have uh, prevention. We're moving out more into population-based prevention, uh, early intervention, uh, again, because trying to move the dial on this, as Mariko said, I think it's so, so important to talk wellness before you get to a point where you need, you know, crisis intervention. We have mental health first aid um, programs. Um, and again, I want to underscore that they also include in the mental health first aid. We also that also includes substance use disorders, how to spot um, early, how to prevent. Um, you know, the longer we can go to delay um, the young person's uh, use uh, closer to 21, um, data has shown they, they almost have a 0% chance of having um, a, a substance use disorder. So the later we can delay uh, use, uh, again, uh, decreases chances of substance use disorder. Well, um, and, and, you know, substance use disorder is a form of self-medication. So is self-harm, right? The release you get from self-harm. So is uh, acting out, right? All these different behaviors, which were seen as flaws in an, in uh, a person's character, uh, are now being reinterpreted as symptoms of, uh, of psychic pain that actually those symptoms can be treated if we get uh, down to root causes. And that's not an event. It's a process, isn't it, David? I mean, it absolutely is. And, and, and Mark, I just, you know, I'm, I've been a social worker for 30, 30 years working with kids, everybody else's kids. Um, they're adult kids. But I have to say, we are consumers of services, our family. And uh, I didn't, I wasn't able to see um, um you know, anxiety and, and uh, mental health issues in my own in my own child. Um, and it got to more crisis. Um, and um, uh, my wife and I, we um, uh, immediately opened up to um, uh, therapy and we engaged our, our ins insurance carrier and all. Um, it, it got it got, you know, pretty bad. It got worse. But since then, again, you know, I've had to deal with that sense of, of sort of failure, stigma, all kinds of things. And I'm in the field, you know, I'm in the field. Um, I should know better. And I'm not um, alone in my own uh, circle, uh, close circle. In addition to that, um, we've, we've, um, we have uh, family members who engage in different forms of self-harm as a way to, uh, to release um, uh, in, in my own, um, upbringing as a child, um, I experienced, uh, things that now in retrospect, I understand better than I did, uh, previously. You're not alone. You're not alone. It's, it, it really does affect us all. And it's not because we're clueless. It's just that we're living lives and then we learn. And, and it, the, the, the importance is in how you respond and how your family responds. I, I, I really admire uh, the fact that you're even willing to share with us, which is so informative to us all. Thank you so much. Absolutely. And, and just by sharing, I think um, for, for many, again, that stigma, we're trying to erase that stigma that it's okay to ask for help. And as parents, uh, as a parent myself, we, we know how difficult it is to be a parent, especially during these times. One statistic I share during COVID, we had a 700% increase from one of our school districts. So, from parents who were now distance learning with their children and they didn't understand how challenging it was and they themselves needed that assistance. So I think we're all struggling in our own ways. And, you know, kudos to, to Oppenheim for, for raising this issue and, and really tackling this in an open conversation. Well, I think there's another aspect here that you're both raising, and I think this is really uh, important. It's the idea of, of treatment being a holistic process. It actually gives us a path toward a societal healing as well as an individual one. Um, these threads of, of uh, mental health needs, that's me. That's me personally. 
That's my parents and my and my children, right? It's my aunts and my uncles and my cousins and my nieces and nephews. It's my friends. We're all in this together. And uh, maybe the mental health um, uh, um, approach is just to sit down and chat one evening and just talk about the things that concern us. Or maybe it's working with a therapist. Who knows, David, right? I mean, it could be, it's all of the above. Um, and, and sometimes a therapist can talk about something that people who know us, yep. we can't approach them. Absolutely. You know, and I, I think that that, you know, I appreciate your message earlier too, Mark. I mean, and, and um, you know, Mariko as well, you know, because this affects all stratas, all demographics, it's the great equalizer, right? right. I mean, is um, behavioral health Patients, issues. creeds, color, income and level. They, Right. Everybody, everybody, ability, disability, it doesn't matter. It's all of us. It, it's amazing. And and that the 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 recovery side of it also is the most amazing equalizer uh, across all demographics. And it's it's such an empowering, you know, strength based community to be a part of and to witness to see our daughter learning skills and, you know, life skills that. Um, we thought we were teaching her and we thought we were practicing and lo and behold, we needed, you know, we needed some help. And we need an education as well. Right. So, you it's, know, I, I, I'm a social worker. I'm an Asian male social worker. I thought I was the best listener in the world. My God, <laughs> you know, um, I, I had to learn a few things um, and uh, uh, still practicing and still still learning. Uh, but, you know, it, it again, it's being in that community of wellness, of recovery. Uh, of hope. Um, and, um, you know, it's helped through the, through the pandemic. Uh, and still, uh, it's the gift that keeps giving. We also have to have to recognize that while we are all in this, in this uh, process, there are some places where the need is, is higher. So could, uh, let's talk a little bit about how you allocate your scarce resources, because a dollar cannot be spent twice on, on different things. When you look at how you allocate um, your resources, uh, David, where is the most effective balance that you find uh, both on the intake side and on the treatment side? Um, how do you ensure that 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 dollar that you're spending is most of, is most effectively spent? Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Mark. I mean, one of the ways is I think by targeting also getting, I mean, knowing our data, like who is most impacted right now and where do we need to, you know, really to concentrate. And I would say that in the pandemic, it has made it very clear to uh, the provider pool that folks who have had, um, there had been um, health inequities in, you know, pre-COVID are really experiencing those um, inequities, behavioral health inequities in the pandemic even more. So groups that, you know, I think of LGBTQ um, youth um, and, uh, you know, kids, kids of color, um, um, low income kids, rural kids who maybe didn't have connections to for virtual, you know, um, um, either appointments or what, you know, help. The data is showing us that where the impact has, you know, so what you're is, saying is you follow the trauma, right? With, I mean, right now with trauma, scarce resources, right? yeah, with scarce resources, as you've said, we have to look at the data. We have to find out where those, um, the highest need groups right now. And, you know, and the thing is, it's hard because there are high need groups everywhere. That's the, again, as we said, this is the great equalizer. Are you also, Mariko, when you when you go into a school and you're you're trying, you know, if you look at, at at kids in a school, there are certain kids who um, are more likely to experience traumas, as as, as David uh, indicated. So you kind of have to look at data and you have to sort of align your resources and your approaches uh, accordingly. Are you also going in that way, or are you just sort of being present and you're you're Making yourselves available and, and and allowing the 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 students to basically uh, self-select. Um, a 
combination of all of the above. Uh, by being a, we definitely by being there and having that presence, um, we're we're open for any dry drop ins or what we call crisis. But I think by being there on a campus and having that psychoeducation with school staff, that's where we are able to best allocate our resources. Really working with our schools so that they understand how to help triage and what comes to us counselors um, is at a different level than what maybe the academic counselor or maybe what the school staff could help um, mitigate. So really working in partnership with the school so that we're doing a, a triage amongst ourselves of who will get a referral for, uh, for counseling and then ultimately being available and having time so that for students that are dropping in, we have the capabilities. But, you know, with community-based organizations like ours, there's never enough resources. So data always helps. And for those that are, are thinking about how to help agencies like ours, I mean, we always need more resources for data. That's where we can help drive our research and drive the programs that need to be changed. That's it's just a great point to end on, Mariko. Uh, thank you so much. I think that the biggest uh, takeaway that I'm coming away with is that is that we we are constantly needing to be attentive to each other, uh, really listen, um, and uh, try to respond without an expectation that somehow our response is going to be perfect. Right? I mean, we're. we're this is a process. Um, tomorrow we'll be smarter at that process than we are today. Uh, there is no silver bullet. And, and so just like everything else in, in our lives, uh, we have to just keep trying and doing what we can, starting off with listening and then trying to respond in ways that are meaningful to our youth. Mariko Sayak, Executive Director of Cassie Counseling and Support Services for Youth. David Mineta, President and CEO of Momentum for Health California. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing this really important topic with us, with us all, and uh, come again on on um, on uh, uh, next Tuesday. We'll have uh, another show, and and uh, and hopefully uh, um, the next one is going to be on on uh, biodiversity. Have a great day. Have a great Thank day. You. Have a good Thank day, you, David. Good Thanks, to see Martin. you. Great job.